Hi everyone, welcome to the Church Explained Podcast, a conversation to grow your leadership and build your church. Today we are on season three of the podcast. Season three, yes. Hard to believe, isn't it? We've I done know, two know. seasons and here we are, season who, three. Who knew it? And it's 2023. 2023. So we're excited to be here today. We've yeah. got an amazing guest yeah. lined up. Yeah. Do you want to tell us some more about this amazing guest? Yeah. Because you know him. I don't really know him. No. Well, but uh, we're going to find out about him today, Lowell. Well, we got Dan Blythe with us, who is uh, uh, part of Youth Alpha, and uh, we'll explain that a little bit. We... Me and Dan know each other through uh, youth ministry and youth pastoring together. But awesome. here's, here's a little bit more about Dan that he wrote about himself. So uh, uh, let's see if it's any good. It's well written. It I is. Think. It well is. Done. It yeah, is well, well written. written. Yeah. Uh, but Dan, uh, uh, it was while backpacking in Australia, aged 18, that Dan encountered Jesus and went on to study for two years at C3 Bible College, specializing in youth ministry. When he headed back to the UK, age 21, he started in a role as a youth pastor in Canterbury, Kent. There he led an interdominational youth ministry called Change. He met his wife, Charlie, at a festival called Soul Survivor. And after marrying, they became active members of Hillsong Church in London. Over the next decade, Dan worked as part of the staff team at Hillsong and led the youth and young adults and later the creative team. Dan is now the global youth director for Alpha, which he describes as his dream job. Dan and Charlie have two boys, Knox, age four, and Nico, age one. Dan supports Chelsea, and we won't hold that against him. And he spends his free time at his boxing gym and decided that 2022 was the year he would finally learn to cook. Dan, it's so good to have you on the podcast, mate. Thanks so much, guys. It's an honor to be here. Uh, yeah, welcome. We're so excited. Mm. So a couple of things I want to pick up on. Go that, for it. They're not even questions, but I just want to dive into that. It, it, it says here, his boxing gym, is it your boxing gym or just a gym you go to? Yeah, it's just a gym I, I go to, unfortunately. Oh, I would like to right, own my it, boxing one day. All right, because uh, the way it was written, I thought you owned it there for a moment because <laughs> you, you seem to own everything else around the world. So, uh, But anyway, so good to have you and, mm. and uh, we're excited today, aren't we? Yeah, really? we are. Yeah. So I wonder, could we just dive in and get a few questions to you today, Dan? How would that be? Absolutely, yeah, let's go. So let, let's think about uh, your role with Alpha at the minute. What, what does that look like? Because that sounds like, uh, as you said, a dream job. Why is it your dream job? Tell us a wee bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, ever since I was 18 and I became a Christian, I've always just had a heart to help young people just have a space to encounter God's grace. And I've been in youth ministry all the way through my life, apart from the last couple of years when I was working for Hillsong, when I became creative director. And it was in that role where I was like learning to lead creatives. And I was sort of like sort of saying, God, why am I doing this? Uh, like, why this role? But um, it's funny because I wouldn't have got this job that I'm doing now if I hadn't have done that role of being creative director. Because a lot of what we do with Alpha is content creation. And it's funny how even when you're in seasons of life, when you're like, God, what are you doing here? He's always doing something. He's always preparing for something that he might have in the future. And so this role that I'm in now, it's, it's helping young people have conversations about faith, life, meaning and purpose. Purpose. There's a lot of culture and content creation involved in it. And um, really, I get to listen to youth leaders and young people around the globe to make sure that we can help serve them and equip them. I love that. And, and thinking of that stuff that you're doing with Alpha, what, what's your big focus at the minute? We, we, we want a little bit of a, not, not the sort of general stuff you tell everyone, everyone. We want the sort of behind the scenes stuff, you know, under the radar. What's your big focus at the minute? Yes, yeah, so at the moment I'm working on creating the new Alpha Youth film series. The last one came out in 2017. It's been done by three million young people around the globe. But COVID just put a big expiry date on it. And even though the theology is still true, the, uh, the packaging and some of the methodology needs to be changed. So we're working on that right now. And we're going to do English speaking version, Latin American version, Asia version, um, Africa version, German, French, Arabic, Indian. So we're just doing a lot of contextualization. Young hosts in localized uh, countries just so it's not like created in the west for the rest it's like you know local for them i like that not yeah. created in the west for the rest i haven't heard that before i like that Dan. i might steal that actually <laughs> that's a good little phrase there and listen a little while back we had your boss on this show actually shayla Vissa. uh she said your boss yeah she's still my boss and she's a great boss i'm so uh, grateful for her 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll give her a shout out on the podcast yeah, yeah. as well. She did a great job with us back in 2021, I guess, was it? It, it was, yeah. Season one. It was, season one. Great season job. one. People great can job. go back and listen to that. Um, so we, we want to explore this idea of engaging uh, this generation, Generation uh, Z or Z, however you pronounce that. Uh, we want to uh, explore that today because I think um, uh, there are some studies out there and uh, it's a big generation uh, that's available mm. to us as church. So Dan, I wonder if you'd just dive in a little bit on describing who is uh, Gen Z and also what are some of the interesting learnings from studies or experiences you found with that generation? Yeah, so Gen Z were born between 1995 and 2009 and so that means they're aged between 10 and 24. So you've got teenagers in there and sort of young adults. The next generation coming after that is called Generation Alpha. We didn't name them that, some other person did in Australia. And that's the generation that's under 10, which is also a really exciting generation to be thinking about. But Gen Z are the teenagers of today, and they're a generation that has been labeled by the world as um, snowflakes. They're entitled, they don't show up, they don't do what they say they're gonna do. They, they ghost you, which is when they text you. Well, you text them and you call them, but they don't text or call you back. And um, a lot of the stereotypes and labels around this generation that the world puts on them are very negative. And I just love to spend some time always thinking about what does God say about this generation. And when I think about snowflakes, you know, especially here in London, when they move together, they shut down streets, shops and schools because there's power in togetherness. And that's what I'm seeing about this generation, Gen Z, because of the digital revolution. They're coming together and they're bringing around change, not just micro change, but macro change. But when you think about thousands and thousands of snowflakes moving together, you get what's called an avalanche. And an avalanche totally reshapes the landscape. And when I think about you know, the last couple of years and the change that Gen Z have brought around, that's what we're seeing. It's almost like this cultural avalanche. You know, within that, you'd call you know, the big cancel culture and all the rest of it. And um, I really believe that as the church, as Christians, it's our job to sort of go in the middle of the avalanche and find out like what needs to be rescued because even Gen Z themselves are getting sort of like caught up in their own avalanche that they cause themselves. And I think God is using this avalanche. You know, Romans 8 verses 28 it says God turns all things around for good for those that love the Lord. Mm-hmm. And I don't think he's afraid of it or worried about it. I think he's going to use it for his glory. But I do think as Christians, it's our job to go in and help rescue these young people uh, that are being hugely, um, I guess, knocked sideways by what's happening culturally. And then also make sure that the church is being rescued because, you know, one of the things that is getting battled through this avalanche is definitely the church. But like I said, I don't think God's fearful of it at all. No. I wonder if you could tap in a little bit. I know um, uh, you partnered with Barna on a study uh, that you guys did there at Alpha uh, around this generation. I wonder if there were some things that really stood out to you through that study um, that you could just, uh, uh, you know, give to our listeners today. Yeah. And for those that haven't heard about this study, uh, we listened to 25,000 teenagers across 20 countries around the world. And the, the survey, the study was called the Open Generation, because when we got all the results back, what we realized is that this generation is really open and inclusive. They want to listen and they want to learn. And so, I mean, there was lots of different things that I could talk about for hours that sort of came up. But uh, one of the interesting facts was how they see Jesus and how they see Christians, so how they see the church. They see Jesus as um, loving, kind, and accepting. And they see Christians as judgmental, strict, and exclusive. So there's a real gap between how teenagers see Jesus and how teenagers see Christians. And so, you know, one of the things that I always put out there when we're looking at this study with other church leaders and youth leaders is like, how do we bridge that gap? Mm. Yeah, Yeah, that's some great stuff there. And what do you think are the other barriers then for this generation that we're talking about today? What are the barriers that are out there regarding faith? Mm. So evangelism is one of the things which um, Alpha really leans into. And so we ask young people, sort of, what does evangelism look like for you? And um, one of the things that they seem to be really pulling away from is this, like, uh, you know, in the middle of the street, giving out a leaflet, like, turn or burn, like, lack of relationship. So they like to do evangelism um, through relationship, because if there's no trust, um, they don't care what you have to say. And it's that old saying, I remember when I was 21 at Bible college, and they said, when it comes to youth ministry, young people don't care what you know until they know that you care. 
And it's a bit of a, a throwaway, but it's still so true, like especially for this generation. Like it, uh, trust and relationship is key. The other things that they, they're looking for is a non-judgmental, free listening space so that they can invite their non-Christian friends into a space and they're not going to be judged for their lifestyle or judged for their opinions. Um, and then they're also happy with um, healthy disagreement. So on social media, you'll see a lot of shots fired, a lot of disagreement, a lot of hate there. But the algorithms are really triggered towards that stuff and they'll push that stuff more. When you actually get a space of young people together, it's very different to what you see on social media. They're actually okay with um, healthy disagreement, listening to each other's uh, point of view. Um, we've heard stories of like young Muslims and young Christians just sitting down, having long conversations about their difference in faith and still having a great relationship throughout that. Um, and then I think finally, one of the things when it comes to evangelism, they want to see word with, that, with action. So you can't say loving the poor if the church isn't doing anything for the poor. And so they actually want to see the whole, the whole Christian faith demonstrated visibly um, in, the, in their community locally. So preaching is one thing, but they want to see a lot of action accompanied to the preaching. Yeah. I, w- I wonder if there's anything. Uh, so y- we're talking about some barriers here and barriers to faith. And mm. uh, you're, you're mentioning uh, some of the things that they're open to. I wonder if there's any stories that you have through you know, like uh, chatting with youth pastors. I know you go all over the all over the world, and you're chatting with youth pastors all over the world. I wonder if there's any stories of where people have done that well in terms of opening a space for that conversation. Yeah. And I know at Youth Alpha, you've got your uh, I don't know inflatable uh, sofa thing that uh, you pop up. I wonder if there's any great stories that you could just share. Yeah, definitely. And um, I think it's really important when we start to look at patterns and trends from these global studies, every teenager is unique and every teenager is different. And even though we do these studies, what might work in a local church with your local youth group might not work and might not uh, work with the survey. So what I'm trying to say is um, the best stories that I've heard is when a youth leader hasn't just listened to what everyone else is saying about youth ministry. They've listened to their young people and they've asked them, you know, like, what is it that you're passionate about? What is it that you care about? What would create a space for you to invite your friends? And then they've actioned that. And so what works in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, definitely won't work in London. And what works in London probably won't work in, um, you know, in, in Argentina. And so I think the best stories I've heard is literally just when youth leaders have thought about what does a safe space look like for their local young people. And then they've really been able to um, let go of uh, the, the strategies and the things that have worked last year and then created something new for this year. So really like um, holding everything that we've done in the past really lightly in our hands, which is really hard to do because, you know, if something worked last year, you think, why won't it work next year? But I think if, we, if we're really caring about these young people, then what we're doing is we're listening to the young people that we have today rather than the young people that we're maybe looking after three years ago and allowing the youth ministry to really evolve and change as the, as the young people evolve and change in the sort of culture and society very good no, great. Dan you, you've mentioned a couple of things there that I think would be good for us just to pick up on yeah. which is around this creating a safe space and uh, building trust with young people uh, as we think of uh, our listeners today maybe lots of leaders out there youth pastors church leaders uh, you know obviously they can do those two things which seem to be big things really mm. aren't they what else can they do to really begin to engage with this generation yeah, um, such such a great question. Um, so I think we've got to look at like what is what is the metrics or what are the KPIs, key performance indicators here. Mm. Normally in youth ministry and Sunday services, a lot of the metrics are how many people attended our Sunday service. And uh, if you look at the way Sunday is set up, it's rows, and we come in with our notepad and we listen to the preacher and we take the three points and then we go home. And that's that's great because we're teaching the Bible. But young people have ten questions for every one point the preacher has preached. And so this small group environment, the the connect groups, um, I would say I would encourage like what emphasis, um, what resource, what time and energy are you pouring into those small groups? Because that's really where uh, a lot of discipleship and fruit happens. Uh, and then I'd also say, how are we raising up youth leaders um, and we're trusting them that they're just going to be faithful stewards of the young people that they've got to disciple? So, you know, they might not have, you know, 50 young people on a Friday night 
fill in the auditorium, but that youth leader might have gone to like a football game to, to listen to them and to support them. Uh, they might have called them up midweek to pray for them for the exam, might have taken them for Nando's when they failed the exam. And so a lot of those metrics, um, they're not as easy, as easy to record and to, to share, but I think if we just raise up youth leaders that we really just trust to get on with the work and just you know, be praying for them. And I think finally, I'd just say, don't see youth ministry as this, as this separate thing, like this is the church and the youth ministry is over there. Try to do everything you can to bring the youth ministry in so it's all one. And I think that's one thing that I've seen you know, Nathan do over the years at your church, is that that youth ministry isn't a side part of the church. It, it is the church. And um, a lot of the elder people that you have in your own community, I just see them welcoming and loving the, that generation, almost being sacrificial with style so that this next generation can access God's presence. And I think um, you guys do such a great job at that thanks mate yeah. no i think what one of the things um that you just said there that i think is really important for people to recognize and you might be a church leader listening to this or a youth pastor yeah. but might be thinking about this leadership is you know like you say the metrics you know like they turn up at youth on a youth night and whatever that looks like it's easy to do that but it's harder to you know the metric of you know they went to their football game they rang them up to yeah. pray with them before the exam um they took them to nando's because where else would you take them um the best chicken ever um and we're not sponsored by Nando's, but Nando's, if you are listening to this, we Give are us, welcome talk to, us, to, uh, talk to uh, be sponsored. But I think sometimes when success and we determine success sometimes in the church world by those metrics, you know, who turns up on a Friday, I think sometimes when success does happen, we forget all of the other stuff that went before, the phone calls, the Nando's, all of that kind of stuff mm -hmm. before. And I just yeah. want to encourage someone today to say, hey, don't stop doing that stuff because maybe you've seen some level of growth. It was actually that stuff that built yeah. those relationships and the trust mm. that then enabled the conversations and enabled them to go, do you know what? I can bring my friends to this. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I think that's just such a great point there, Dan, for people yeah. to take away. And, and I think that's where a, lo a, lo that's where a lot of the work's done, isn't it? Yeah. Really? In those conversations, mm. in that pre-stuff before you get to a Friday night or a Sunday. Yeah. And one of the things we've been talking about even here at Icon Church is around how we measure those metrics so rather than just thinking of a Sunday or groups we're trying to think a little bit outside of that so mm. rather than thinking of connect groups we're thinking of midweek connections and I guess it's all all those types of mm. connections and that for young people as someone takes them out like keep those in mind because they're doing something aren't they yep. in the life of a young person and in the life of the church yeah, I guess yeah. I wonder, Dan, if you could uh, touch on a little bit. Obviously, you mentioned earlier about how how they view the church, mm. and uh, you know uh, maybe you know you, you talked about those connect groups and church. You know, thinking about leadership. But what about for us in terms of our services, in terms of the things we do right now? How how, how does the church begin to mm. engage with that generation in the things that we do currently? Yeah, um, again, such a great question. Um, so one of the things that we ask young people about is, what are you really passionate about? And one thing kept coming up is that they, they do want to make the world a better place. And this came from Christian young people and non-Christian young people. And then we asked them, you know, what is number one when it comes to making the world a better place? And in around the world, they all had different things as number one. So in America, it was anti-racism. Um, in Brazil, it was... Um, uh, p uh, poverty uh, in the UK and parts of Europe it was global climate change in Indonesia and Malaysia it was political corruption but what we got to see is like what was bubbling to the top when young people um, care about making the world a better place and so one of the things I would say is if you're a pastor um, I'd be sitting down with your young people finding about what injustices uh, they see in the world and work out whether we are actually preaching and demonstrating um, a way to actually make the world a better place so if young people are hearing us preach but not preach not talk about the things that they really want to see changed in society ultimately if that's the only glimpse they're getting of church they think that church doesn't care now we might know that as as individuals we care about a lot of things but they're they're really leaning in especially on the sunday service to see what do you care about the most 
And so I'd be just looking at, you know, what are you teaching? Um, what are you saying? And uh, do young people know that you are passionate about the things that they're passionate about? And then what space are you creating to help equip them and empower them to make the world a better place? Because if they don't think there's a space for that in the church, then they'll just go elsewhere to do that. But ultimately, we know, you know, Jesus and justice go hand in hand. And so, you know, it's a great question to ask is, are we creating space for Jesus and justice and this next generation to move forward in making the world a better place? Yeah, that's fantastic, so that, isn't it? Yeah. Some, some great stuff there. And I guess it comes down to this idea of uh, listening to young people, as you've mm. said there quite a number of times, Dan, because I think the thing that comes to my mind is the fact that, like, even within a culture, like you talk about the UK or Europe, but you've got subcultures within those, don't you? Mm. So we need to be listening, leaders need to be listening well and actually applying that in their setting. So, yeah. hey, we've got, we've got a question again about Alpha. Is that all right? Because uh, we know that's your dream job. So we want to dig in a little bit further and wonder if you can tell us what, what do you think the future of Youth Alpha looks like? We know you've talked about the new Alpha series coming out. What else? Like, what, what's in your heart? What's your dream that you want to make happen through Youth Alpha? Yeah. Um, wow, what a big question. I think um, there's a billion teenagers on the planet. Uh, and so I'd love to create, um, I guess, with our team, some, some content uh, which is going to uh, lead to a conversation for as many of those teenagers around the world to have a conversation about faith, life, meaning and purpose. And so that means, you know, a lot more um, releasing of what we're doing, uh, raising up leaders uh, across the globe. Um, everything we do is for the church. So what we're not is Alpha Youth is not a movement trying to attach a load of teenagers to ourselves. Everything we do, whether it's cultural or content that we create, is there for the church to run. So it's about helping youth groups uh, and their youth ministry uh, become healthier, more whole, and um, hopefully see more people encounter Jesus. So I'd really love to help the church, um, I guess, over the next five, ten years, just be really known for um, their love. And I think really for this generation, if we're going to be known for our love, it's got to be through listening. And so I'd really love to help the church be seen as not as you come to us and listen to us, but actually, no, we're reversing that and we're listening to you. And in that way, through relationship, hopefully you're going to encounter uh, some amazing grace and love that you've never really heard about before. No, that's amazing. And, uh, well, we, we want to go on record and saying big thanks to Alpha. Yeah, great And, job. Uh, you know, we, we, we run Alpha here right. and um, we're looking forward to the new Youth Alpha series as well and uh, getting that planned in. And, yeah, just a big thanks to Alpha for all they've done. If it's all right with you, Dan, we, we just want to get to know you a little bit more to finish off this episode. We've just got three thick quick fire, if I can get the words quick out, fire. quick fire quick. questions <laughs> for you. Now... One of the things that I do with Dan's Instagram, okay, one, it's, it's really cool, um, and that's a 36-year-old saying cool. Are you cool, jealous? So you jealous? I, I am slightly jealous. He's a bit jealous of your Instagram. Uh, of Dan's Instagram. He's, he's a creative. Okay. Um, but the, one of the things that I do love and, uh, is that on his stories from time to time, he will post ha what books he's reading. Okay. And then I screenshot them. Yeah. And then I'll add which ones I like catch my eye to my list. So, Dan, what are your top two book recommendations and why? Oh, that's such a great question. Um, well, at the, if you're thinking about creativity and you want to kind of like move more in the creative stream, I'd say Creativity Inc. by Ed Cutmore. Um, he is the guy who was the CEO of Pixar. And so he just took things to a new level, but in a really healthy cultural way. So I'd recommend that. Um, and in terms of Christian books, uh, I just got a brand new one on liturgy. And liturgy is something that uh, I never, never really thought about, never really liked. I felt it was quite um, forceful in church services you make someone say something but yeah again i'm learning so much about different cultures different denominations and um the just the amount of gold in the truth in liturgy so um all i know is, is it's about liturgy but i can't remember the actual title of it but that's the one that i recommend <laughs> Great. well you can send that on to us and we can stick that in the show notes can't yeah, we? Yeah. hey and, and you've mentioned already a little bit in your bio about what you do for fitness well tell us a little bit more how do you stay healthy what do you do um, that we you haven't already told us. 
Yeah, I exercise uh, six days a week um, from 7 till 7.45 at my boxing gym. Uh, and I just, for me, that's like, I've got no phones, got nothing, and I'm just, um, you know, smashing those punch bags. And so for me, that's, I, I think it's very therapeutic. You know, there's no kids around me and stuff. Uh, and then as much as I can, um, I just eat as healthy as I can, and I get to sleep as early as I can. Awesome. I, I stayed at Dan's house once, yeah. and um, he, he, was, he was out uh, – going i don't know if he went to the gym or for a run around 7 a.m nice uh i stayed in bed yeah um <laughs> at that point so amazing so you you mentioned in your bio that uh, this year has been the year you finally learned to cook so what's the best meal you've cooked oh that's that's a that's a tricky one because my wife is the one who really like is the the taste tester but i'd say her favorite one is this salmon with coriander uh honey crushed pistachios crushed uh garlic potatoes and uh tender stem broccoli nice wow. is that is that baked in the oven yeah yeah yeah, sound, sounds good. That sounds good. Well, we're getting hungry. It's almost yeah, lunchtime here, right here in the UK. Yeah. And we are getting hungry. But mm. listen, it has been amazing, Dan, to have you with mm. us. We're sharing you guys on with the Youth Alpha stuff and, of course, all uh, Alpha Global. It's such a privilege to have you here with us. And just to share those insights around Gen yeah. Z or Gen Z, depending what part yeah, of the world yeah. you're in. Uh, but for us today, that is a wrap. Do you want yeah. to tell people what else they can find, Nathan? Yeah. Well, Dan, why don't you just share where people can, um, you know, your social media, yeah. maybe uh, Youth Alpha, how they uh, get Connecting. that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to say, guys, thank you so much for having me on this podcast. Um, I love Icon Church. And every time I've been there, uh, I've just walked away with like um, such a, I guess, a bit of a wow moment of, of the community that you have there. I think a lot of stuff can be manufactured but i think um experiencing your community like you walk away and just like just grateful for that authenticity that you guys have there so thanks for having me but yeah in terms of like alpha youth uh the website is just youth.alpha.org and then in, if you're on instagram or tiktok it's just at alpha yth and you'll find all of us or stuff there and more information about it awesome well, Dan, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Yeah. And thanks to everyone who's uh, listened to this. Please rate, review, share, subscribe, however you consume this content. And don't forget, we've got a load of resources, free resources at icon.church forward slash open. And it's been great to be together Wonderful. exploring this topic, engaging Gen Z. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next time on the Church Explained podcast. Mm -hmm.